Today's guest is Teddy Abrams of the Louisville Orchestra. For the last decade, Teddy has been a conductor, pianist, clarinetist, and composer, and presently serves as the music director of the Louisville Orchestra and the Brit Festival Orchestra. Under his leadership, the Louisville Orchestra has experienced unprecedented success, and its attendance has increased 30%. As Musical America's 2022 Conductor of the Year, Teddy has been featured on CBS Sunday Morning, The New Yorker, and NPR, among other media outlets. Teddy, thanks for being here. I really, I really appreciate you being here, taking the time. I know you're so busy. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Yeah, no, this is the, we're gonna have fun, and 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 I and I really wanted to 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 jump in because you know as I read your story, um, just amazing. I thought I knew a lot of your story, but I learned a lot <laughs> in, in in getting ready for us uh, getting together today, and so I I, I read that you be you you began improvising at the age of three, and taking formal le- well, this on the piano, on the keyboards, uh, and then formal lessons at the age of five, clarinet, the age of eight, and then developed an interest in, in conducting after uh, attending the Symphony of San, San Francisco. Uh, and, at the, and that was at the age of nine. And by the age of 12, and I have a really cool interest in this, you began studying conducting and mus- musicianship under... Michael Tilson Thomas. Yes, yep, that's yeah. you you're on top of it. You well, know the whole I, story. I I grew up in Buffalo, New okay. York. And Michael Tilson Thomas at that time was the music director of the Buffalo Philharmonic. Yeah. And my parents called me the other day and said, "Do you know Teddy Abrams?" And apparently you were in Buffalo recently. Yeah, I was <laughs> I was guest conducting the Buffalo Philharmonic, which was so fun because uh, Tilson Thomas was my teacher growing up, and of course he'd been the music director of the Buffalo Philharmonic in the 70s, and I was actually doing a big piece of music that he wrote at the Buffalo Phil, so it felt like a very special full circle moment there to to go to his former orchestra, which in his life was actually very similar to to the way that the Louisville Orchestra mm. relates to to my life here. It, both uh, situations were our first big music director position, so uh, that was a really wonderful thing. Buffalo, it's a cool, yeah, it's yeah. A cool town. They, they 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 heard your, there there was something on the news about it, and they oh, said, wow. "Well, you must know Teddy." Small Abrams. world. Yeah, it really is. It really is. I well, I'm proud of that. Those roots that I have back there, and it's great that we have the, the Philharmonic there, and it was wonderful that you were able to go up there and play with them, or oh, conduct. Yeah, yeah, most, yeah. most American cities still have really great orchestras. You know, a few have, have seen things come and go, and uh, a few have had some turnover or some restarts, but but most American orchestras uh, that are full-time in, in major cities are, are actually really remarkably great. That's it's, amazing. It's a, you know, it's one of those funny things, like with all nonprofits, it, uh, it often feels like the sky is falling, but right. sometimes some amazing things are happening, you, you almost take that for granted. Yeah, and I do, I, I, I do want to get into that, but before we do that, you know, talking about at the age of three and then, you know, at the age of five and eight, the clarinet, and nine, and then at age 12, you clearly had a, a significant amount of influence really early on uh, in, in, in your life, and tell us what that meant to you at that time and what it means to you now. You mean to have the, the yeah, influential people. Yeah, to have those influences. People. Yeah, it's really unique. Um, y- classical music, which is a you know, funny terminology that I don't use all that much anymore because it doesn't really mean very much, actually, you know, classical music. But but it it's not so much a sound as it is a practice. So in that context, it's actually somewhat helpful. So classical music being you know the system of learning an instrument at a, at a certain age or at a certain point in your life and following certain principles and learning that instrument and then figuring out Western notation and integrating that into your education. Thinking about classical music in that way, Uh, It's one of the few remaining disciplines in life where we still use the master-student or master-pupil model that was very common in almost every trade uh, in most of the world, especially in in, uh, Europe, uh, throughout the, the, you know, the I guess you could say the Dark Ages, the medieval period, through the Renaissance, up into the Baroque and what we call an art, the Romantic era. Uh, and and so most of, of the, the modern trades that were born out of that period developed 
uh, using an educational method where you find a person who does the trade at a really high level, it could be your, you know, father, I mean, mm-hmm. I guess in some cases mother, but in a lot of cases it just was the father because that, that's how things were playing out. Um, or some other famous uh, master practitioner of a, of a profession. And you'd seek them out and, and ask them for lessons. And, and you would study and apprentice with them until you could yourself become a master. And we've dropped that from almost everything in society. I mean, if you're going to learn to code, you don't go seek out the great master mm-hmm. Uh, you know who's who's you know coding in in Java or whatever, and then and study with them privately. But but you know in music it remains one of the very few, or perhaps the only thing I could think of off the top of my head, where we still use that almost medieval system. Mm. And there's almost no way to learn music without finding an individual mentor who becomes an almost parent figure, like a parental kind of figure in your life. Uh, and you may have several of those kind of mentors, but it's that individual relationship between you as a student and somebody that, that you look up to as, as again, a father or mother or, or something all between that and uh, a guru. It's, it's this, this, uh, this unique relationship that we still use as the basis for learning to play music. And it's almost necessary uh, because the, the kind of things that we value as musicians are, are such a strange mix of technical which one could learn in a book, um, but usually would not motivate anybody to master it. Uh, and then the spiritual, which you could read about you know, to, to the end of your days and never pick up without the transference of somebody who inspires you to find that. So uh, it's, it's one of the things I think about all the time. If I had not had the mentors that I had growing up, I would not be sitting in this chair. Mm. I certainly wouldn't be uh, privileged enough to have the position of being music director of the Louisville Orchestra. I had a series of teachers, both on clarinet and piano, and then uh, my my mentor, Michael Tolson Thomas, who became my conducting teacher, who changed my my life. I can absolutely say that it was their influence and working with them and the care that they put into my own education and me as a human being that gave me my values, that that gave me my understanding of who I am as an artist and what art means in society. All these things were were imprinted because of those relationships that I had, and it's, it's an act of generosity that they did this. It's not transactional. I find that fascinating. And what's coming to mind right now is studying and and learning conducting um you don't play all the instruments mm-hmm. you, you play a lot yeah yeah you learn but you about have to all understand the but you have to you have to have an understanding i mean I, I just find it fascinating the conductor and 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 i think if people actually knew more about the importance of that they would really find it fascinating and the reason i say that is I, I had I had the honor to to be the chair of the Louisville Ballet for a number of years, uh, and work with Bruce, Bruce Simpson, mm-hmm. and learned a lot about dance and the ballet, um, not because I was dancing, but just as the board chair to understand that. But the important I, I never really fully appreciated the importance of the conductor for the dancers, as yes. well. And I always remember when you go to the Nutcracker and the conduct the loudest cheer would be the conductor coming and and facing <laughs> the audience and everyone would really cheer. But the importance for the dancers to actually see the conductor as well, how important that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that people are clearly well. interested in conductors. Yeah. Um, they've always been to a certain extent. There's a reason that some conductors are really captured people's imaginations and and a certain fascination almost with the celebrity of being a conductor. You look at uh, people like Leonard Bernstein or uh, Herbert von Karajan, even Michael Tilson Thomas yeah. to, to a great extent, Seiji Ozawa, all these these legendary conductors, the generation before them, George Zell and Stokowski and, and uh, Ormandy, uh, Schulte. These, these people were um, incredibly... Uh, connected to the central culture of their time. Now, that's changed as, as so-called classical music has shifted its own relevancies and, and its own relationship to popular culture, then people's understanding of classical musicians has also changed. Mm. So at one time, conductors were some of the most influential artists mm. in America or the world. 
uh, and and there was this association with them, some of which was ridiculous, but but some of which was accurate of of them having a certain personality and behaving a certain way, dressing and and acting and talking uh, with with various characteristics that have become stereotyped uh, ad nauseum. But but again, they're all based on some reality, like all stereotypes. But but clearly the fascination hasn't totally worn off because you look at certain movies that have come out recently, like Maestro about Bernstein and Tar, which is about a fictional conductor. And uh, there's something about conducting more than maybe playing an instrument in classical music that seems to apply to a lot of things beyond the, the music making itself. And it's a reason why, uh, even in corporate culture, people often invite conductors to come talk about the, you know, the the model of conducting an orchestra as a metaphor for running a business. I mean, there's always this interest in in the synergy of of leading an orchestra that lets the the whole become greater than the sum of the parts. And and so the act of conducting, the personality of the conductors, it's, there's always been this certain fascination. And uh, it's really interesting because what what people don't understand is that the modern conductor uh, is actually a very, very different uh, species than most of these stereotypes of conductors, you know, which, which, uh, mm. which used to really be a, a purely musical role. Conductors of the past were expected to get up on the podium, rehearse the orchestra, and then perform and, and be these, these kind of high priests of music and transmit the essential musical information from the score to the audience. And, and that was about it. And as culture has changed, especially in America, but everywhere, conductors are now, well, at least they should be, a much deeper and more integrated part of society, not simply getting on the podium and conducting. That's that's the greatest and maybe most celebrated part of what we do, but really the role is to have a vision for what an orchestra should and can be. And you're not going to see that, because a lot of that is behind the scenes, it's fundraising, it's marketing, and it's also then the other part of the music side, which is studying scores. And all this stuff occurs off the podium. It's not what the public ultimately sees, but in fact, it's the job I'm doing right now. Right. I'm sitting and talking with you about, about music and the orchestra and conducting, and and uh, some of it's not particularly uh, glamorous. In fact, yeah. much of it's not glamorous. When you see me writing emails to, to donors, you know, talking about projects that I'd like to have funded, I mean, that's that's a very different side of conducting than most people think of when they think of the parodies of the, you know, the maestro. Um, but that's that's the job. The job is whatever it takes to make great music for society. I, I, and I would love to, to, to shift to that because you mentioned earlier, you know, the whole nonprofit world and, and you came at a time uh, when there was a lot of challenges at Louisville Orchestra. Uh, and, and again, as, as um, a former board chair, not only of the ballet, but the Fund for the Arts, I at least have a sense for the challenges that, that the arts have had over the years. Uh, and, and I'm seeing that firsthand right now at St. Vincent de Paul, uh, you know, just to be able to make the ends meet and, and to try to balance as you as uh, in your, the position that you're in to try in the position that I'm in to try and balance a healthy tension between the programmatic side of things and the realities of what you can do, and and to try avoid creating uh, an, an environment of scarcity, and more of a or of an environment of abundance and innovation. And gee, maybe we can't do it that way, but we can do it this way. I, and, and I and I saw that firsthand when I was at the ballet with when, when Bruce, I was the, the chair when they um, and redid the brown form and Nutcracker, and he worked his magic with the scenery with folks that he knew from around the world and, and got it done, you know, and it's pretty amazing, actually. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's really amazing how he was able to do what he did. But can you, can you tell us about, I mean, just those tough times and how you manage that to your point about, you know, there's glamorous parts of the job and then there's those parts that are the reality is we got to make the ends meet at, at the end of the day. Yeah, and we, we try and hide that from our audiences because in the end, <clears throat> we're trying to put on extraordinary concerts that inspire people and make them find a way, often to to kind of divorce themselves from the realities of the world, um, sometimes actually connect with the world in a deeper way. But that's what we're trying to do. We're we're, we're in the business of, of actually hiding all, all those things elements mm. that, that you don't see on, on mm -hmm. stage. We don't want people worrying about the finance. In fact, we we want to maybe create the illusion um, that 
that we have all the resources in the world to make the greatest art. And and that's actually always a, a, a challenge and a creative challenge around the parameters of of art, uh, which are often a very good thing. You know, if, if you gave me an unlimited budget, you said, here's $10 million um, to put on a production, th- that might lead you astray because you wouldn't have the creative challenge of saying here are the guardrails here here is the 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 field that you should play in and make something amazing there a lot of the the most amazing and and brilliant pieces of art have come out of limited circumstances and resources not to say that that should always be the case and certainly not talking about compensation i mean artists should be should be compensated and should have should have you know the the, the comfort and expectations of uh, being able to to have a great life for their families um, and themselves but the art making needs certain limitations mm-hmm. often however I think this probably relates very much to your work at St. Vincent de Paul. A culture of poverty um, or a culture of need does not promote human flourishing either. So there's a very, very delicate balance. When people or organizations uh, somehow develop a routine of need, a, a routine of poverty, they start making bad decisions. They start making difficult decisions the wrong way because everything is desperate and everything is a disaster. And this applies, sadly, as much as it does to individuals and families as it does to organizations. So organizations that operate in a culture of, of constant poverty uh, then flail around. They often make decisions that cost them more money in the long term. They don't make the art that they really believe in, which further demoralizes them, limits the resources that they can then solicit and bring in. In, and it's a vicious cycle. On the other hand, if you change the direction of the circle and create a a culture of prosperity, and I don't mean a culture of financial prosperity, I mean a, a culture of artistic prosperity. That is, you make the art that you believe in and you inspire people. You fundraise and, and solicit resources on the basis of the great work that you've done that moved people. And therefore, you feel that you have the resources you need to make more great art, and you set your sights on on even greater and more lofty goals. Then the whole thing moves in a virtuous cycle, and that's what we're trying to do. The virtuous cycle does not need to be massive and huge. It just needs to move in the right direction. The wheel needs to turn the right way. I love that, and and I and I, and I love that because there's so much that's going through my mind as as you talk about that. You know, in terms of that innovation and abundance, and you create something, and you fundraise off of something that you've created. Yes, and and I can draw an ana- I, I can draw a comparison uh, from from the orchestra and and um, you know the innovation there to to what we're doing in the innovation and housing and. Mm-hmm. One 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 would be in our. Uh, I've got two examples. One one would be in our emergency shelter, where most shelters across the United States, emergency shelters, require the individual or or whomever is in their family to 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 leave in the morning, and then come back at the end of the yes. day. Uh, we shifted that. We shifted the circle um, a year ago, September, so that it's no check in and no checkout. Wow. Now, we are able to get others interested. We said we want to do this, and we were able to get others interested in helping us do that because it was a big shift in our operating, you know, to be 24-7. But it's created, it's created opportunities for those that are unhoused that we just, you know, maybe didn't think about, yeah. you know, without – Saying no, we what would happen if you just didn't require folks to check in or check out? And what are the effects? Long, uh, you know, the the one real simple one: folks want to work third shift. You can earn more working third shift than you got a place to go in the day. Shower up, sleep, whatever. Doctors' offices are only open during the day, and if you got to take all your stuff with you, and you know, it's much easier if if you have a place that you know that you're going to come back to it after your doctor's appointment. Uh, you can. It's easier to get there. You can take a shower, or even it's going for a job interview. Again, not having to take all your stuff with you, not you know maybe looking disheveled. You have an opportunity to to pr- present differently in 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 the uh, in the interview. So there's there's 
even more so things beyond that, uh, including our ability then uh, to provide uh, more case management, more mental health and substance use counseling, uh, have more time with, with individuals to be able to kind of wrap their head around the situation. Because when you're on the street and you got the issues that a lot of the folks that we help have, it's hard to wrap your head around that until you're fed, you're housed, you're safe. And how do you deal with, uh, be, I'm sure like anything, you have a, a balance, right? Because there are more people that would love to be able to stay at your facility. That's but right. then offering them a longer time at the facilities is, is, is a huge gift to them and might help them eventually find their own houses. How do you balance those two things? Well, you know, it's interesting, and you're exactly right. What we noticed was that the length of stay length, it, it grew, the length of stay. But the outcomes also grew along with it, mm-hmm. the outcomes being finding permanent housing. So all of these things that have happened because of that one decision, but we made the decision to do it and then got the help kind of thing. We created this beautiful thing. And the other is, and, and I won't go into it, but we have a, a we have a, a facility that's housing veterans. That's very unique uh, in in our community here, uh, and I too think that that, I mean, that clearly is something that we've created, and are now going out to market and talk to folks about and all that kind of thing. And it's going to be wonderful, and there's going to be outcomes that we can't even predict at this point in time. But I bring that back to what you were saying about, you, you know, you create that beautiful thing, right? You you don't not do it because of this decision or that decision. And sometimes when you're in that place of poverty, you don't make any decision. Mm. You don't even move. And then it just you just lose the opportunity. And it's and, yeah. and yeah. You know, it's not a good place to be. It's exactly right. It's yeah. Not a good place to be. Yeah. Yeah. How many people would you house if if you had carte blanche? Let's say somebody did offer you the, the a blank check. I mean, how how many how many rooms are needed in Louisville right now. We so as far as emergency shelter. Yes. Uh if you look across the community um and, and don't hold me to this to, to, to the exact number, but you're looking at 5 or 600 additional emergency shelter beds between all the other needed, emergency yeah, shelters. Is, is you have needed. how many? We have 50. 50. So we need We have another 500. And so, you know, again, the whole issue is is you know, you have to do that in a safe way. Uh, for not only those that you're helping, but for your staff uh, as well. So it it's possible. It's it's not that there's a shortage of space. To me, it's more of a of of a uh, shortage, maybe of will to do it. Uh, and you know, just to be quite honest, you have to be able to operate in a way and have the the funding to be able to operate safely. Yeah. Now. Uh, and, and, and that's needed. And it's not just about individuals. It's about families. We're really short on providing shelter for families. And that's one of the reasons the Community Cares Campus that Mayor Greenberg is putting out there, that they'll, the Volunteers of America will help families as well. We're helping individuals. Yeah, yeah. 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 Otherwise, you know, especially if, if, if they turn people away. Uh, the second morning comes, then that becomes the city's problem again, and right. it becomes the school district's problem again, and then you know the, the community's problem. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that must be a huge uh, game changer for these families it, to, it, it, to stay. It, has has yeah. anybody else followed that model, or, or are you still kind of out there? We're kind of out there on our own a little bit, um, and you know we were able to do it because of the fact that we have it in one facility. Yeah. You know we can keep it safe, we can keep it clean. Uh, and you know, a place where folks want to be. Yeah. Um, but again, ultimately, the the goal is to get the individuals into permanent housing. Yeah, and I that's assume the then get other people to follow that model. Right? Yeah. I mean, it seems yeah. like that's the winning model. That's the it take, probably takes more work and more care and more resources, but it's but it's the right thing to do and yeah. uh, could really change people's lives. But well, I hope other other shelters are able to do that too one day. I hope so. I hope so. Let, so let's let's go back on, onto the orchestra of music without borders. Yeah. I, I want to talk about this because you know the, the mission is, you know, and, and and I know that you're really really behind this, in, in terms of just really making broader and inclusive music available to everyone in our community. And, and I will tell our listeners that uh, at St. Vincent de Paul, we've we've just we've benefited. Uh, from Teddy's mission and the Louisville Orchestra, Orchestra's mi- mission to take music out of the Whitney Hall, out into the community. Uh, at St. Vincent de Paul, we've already had uh, the Louisville Orchestra twice now. Uh, and it, it, both uh, they, they played in our Family Success Center and j- just com- 
phenomenal evenings with the entire orchestra. 90-minute program, uh, you know, probably about 150 folks. Uh, it's free to the public uh, and just being so well re received. And we're really appreciative of, of that. But if talk to the importance, though, of that mission of reaching out and getting to folks that may not necessarily have exposure. Yes, which is a, a big change, I think, for arts groups in general, but especially the, the legacy arts organizations across America, which would be orchestras, opera companies, ballet companies, theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the, the mainline institutions who, for a long time, basically considered success to be the number of tickets sold for their mm. large downtown facilities. Uh, this is common across the country. It's common across the world, but especially in America, where we built these massive temples to art, which are amazing. I mean, we, we have to have these beautiful places in, in, in so many ways. They give the downtown cores of cities uh, a great sense of pride and, and destination and, and, and many other reasons. But they also defined <clears throat> how we considered the organizations to be successful or not by number of people coming to those concerts without considering the social ramifications around that. And it's funny when you think about it because generally the concerts that, that you would attend downtown uh, here in Louisville or in any major city would be relatively expensive. The, the orchestra or the opera is not thought of as something that's particularly affordable, even when they are relatively affordable compared to other things in, in life. But but that was the historical framework for presenting concerts. So it was a, you know, a, a somewhat of an exclusive activity. However, we understand now much better that the goal of an orchestra or any arts organization is not simply to sell as many tickets as possible. That's nice. That's a nice thing to do. It's an important thing to do for the bottom line, too. But that's not the singular goal of these institutions. There are lots of other for-profit entities that are doing that. There are touring acts. Taylor Swift and Bruce Springsteen <laughs> are doing the exact same thing, selling tickets to their concerts. Sporting events do exactly that. That's not what makes us special. It's not what makes us unique. What makes us unique is that we have a call to service we're supposed to be serving the community in whatever way our music leads us. And that means not selling as many tickets as possible to any random concert downtown, but in reaching as many people as we can. Mm. And, of course, that means that there's going to be some kind of democratic or even like a socialist approach where the people that can't afford to see the orchestra or support the orchestra through do donations in a certain capacity will do that. And the other people in neighborhoods where there isn't an economic opportunity to see the orchestra or per maybe it's th there's no history of the orchestra visiting those communities or it might be that, that there are not family resources to find the transportation to the downtown facility. There are many, many reasons that people don't have relationships relationships with mainstream large arts organizations that used to be ensconced in their downtown venues. It's our mission. It's incumbent upon us even. It's not just a mission. It's, it's, it's a necessity to then find these folks and include them in the orchestra. They become a part of our family. They become a part of our season. And we have made that the number one priority. It's, it is, it's a vision and a mission. It's a necessity. It's a value for us that we want to play for everybody in the Louisville community and now by extension the Kentucky community. So the two biggest things that we've done to address that and, and then reflect that in our programming are this series called Music Without Borders, which takes us to three locations in Louisville outside of downtown. One is in the California neighborhood, one is in Shelby Park at St. Vincent de Paul, and the other is in J-Town. And we play three different concerts at each of those locations totally free with all kinds of activities for kids before, and anybody who comes to those concerts then gets tickets to come downtown if they want to come to any of our shows at Whitney Hall, which, by the way, we love our downtown hall. We love playing the kind of mainline classics programs, but those are only valuable if they're in the context of a season that includes everyone. And paired with that Music Without Borders program is the Kentucky tour that we've been doing now in partnership with the General Assembly of Kentucky, who gave us an award that was sizable enough to tour every single part of the Commonwealth in a massive program. I mean, it's almost like a, a, a you know a giant WPA kind of program, you might say. It's a, it's a huge social project that is 
really not a music program as much as it is a social cohesion program. It's designed to bridge the urban world divide through music. So we're in the middle of the touring right now. We're out in every single part of Kentucky, uh, visiting the east, west, north, south, you name it. We have been there. And the the whole goal is to bring our music again through free programming, through lots of, of uh, programs that are even beyond the actual full orchestra concert to every community in Kentucky. And, and these are mission-driven. Mm. These are mission-driven. This is not because we just want to play more shows. This is because we want our music to actually do something so we can tell people why orchestras matter. We know why they matter, but we have to demonstrate it. You know, that's amazing. I noticed that on your website, all the different shows that you had and all the different places that you were going. I never really focused on how hard that must be as well. Difficult to, to, to do what you're doing, but with that said... It is so important. It's so much a part of the, the, the mission. I can imagine that um, the reaction that you're getting from these communities are really positive. Oh, it's, it's overwhelming. To take music and do it in a loving way, but to mm. take music to a place uh, that has never heard an orchestra before. But in Kentucky has a tremendous appreciation for music because it's a very, very musical state. But to then take an orchestra to a place where there's never, ever been an orchestra is one of the most magical things ever. It's one of the great reflections of, of human beings to see all these musicians working together without even having to talk to each other, just have them making music by playing their own independent parts that comes together in, in a way that truly is greater than the sum of the parts. There is, I think, no better symbol for human beings working together. And so the orchestra is something everybody should get to, mm. to access in their, their lives. Nobody should be um, precluded <clears throat> from, from a relationship with a symphony orchestra because regardless of what, where it's from or when it's from, yeah, it might be the product of you know the, the 17th and 18th centuries in, in Europe. That might be its origins, but now it's a symbol of, of human beings in general. So everyone should have the right to see it and experience it. What is the, um, <clears throat> what is the importance to Louisville of having the Louisville Orchestra, a ballet, opera, um, theater. Uh, it, to, yeah. to, to me, it means so much to Louisville, but it, from your perspective, they have that ecosystem of <clears throat> many different sized organizations as well. It seems like we have a, a pretty vibrant community in that respect. We, we do. You know, I think that it's clear that these organizations don't always have the financial security that they need to do their very best work, uh, and that's a challenge. And you know, one of the reasons that we focus so much at the orchestra on mission and the the changes in society that we're trying to help inspire and, and affect uh, is because we want to demonstrate the essential nature of music in in our community. We never want to be put on the sideline and say we're an extra, we're vestigial, that we can just be cut loose if things get tough. We want to be essential and connected to the to the fabric of society in in the most uh, meaningful and powerful way. But we all have to do that as as artists. We have to constantly renew that same sense of mission. I'll say this: I just went to the ballet the the other night, a couple of days ago, to see their performance of of Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet, and. I was so blown away by, by what I saw on stage. And of course, I've worked with the ballet for years here, and I, and I know they're tremendous, but I rarely get to sit in the audience. Normally, it's a collaboration that I'm involved in. And I was so inspired and, and moved by the talent in our city, the talent of these dancers who are all full-time employees at the ballet. And just thinking that there are still so many people in Louisville that don't get to experience the full range of art and artists that, that we have here in our town. I was at the Actors Theater a couple months ago seeing their production of King John, which was so creative and special. And and it was another reminder, like <clears throat> everybody in our city should should feel the that same sense of pride and excitement at living in Louisville right now. <coughs> but there is a big gap between those that they have access to this. And even beyond that, those that should have access to this but don't even take advantage of it. And then those that don't even know that this is occurring in their in their town right now. And these are disparities that we have to address. They're inequalities that are that are unacceptable. Um, and and again, even the people that may have the financial means 
and the time to access this, but don't realize it's here or don't invest themselves of it. We need to make sure that these these folks are participating in in art because it's the it's the town forum. It's the place where people come together, and it's not something that's sectarian. It's not something that's by affiliation. It's not religious. It's not political. These art-making institutions are doing this to provide the space where communities, dis- despite great differences in demographics, all share something that belongs to them. That's why it's the Actors Theater of Louisville. It's why it's the uh, Louisville Ballet. It's why it's the Louisville Orchestra. The, the name of the city is in the, the title of all these institutions because they belong to everyone. They're part of a community trust. But if we have people that either can go and aren't going or can't go, then we have to address those. We have to address those issues because then it only belongs to the few. <clears throat> Teddy, um, you're a blessing uh, to this community. And, you know, it, it, it's, it, we're, we're, we're so fortunate um, to have you and, and, and others in those other organizations that I've grown to know and become friends with. Uh, you, you and I chatted <clears throat> when you were at St. Vincent de Paul, and I'm good friends with Ben Soli, and you know his generosity of spirit of also believing that music should belong to all. Yes. Uh, you know we're we're blessed to have so many wonderful individuals in this in this community uh, to, to do that. And it takes all of us to do that. I mean, what we're doing at St. Vincent de Paul is very different. Um, but when we can marry together and bring together what you all offer, uh, and, and the generosity of spirit that you all have, it's a really beautiful thing. I know at, at the last, uh, when Gabe Lefkowitz was, uh, conducting, um, there were a, a number of our, uh, folks that live on campus that came and there was some kids too. And, oh, and you all oh. do some things with the kids where they created some music, and, and it was really cool. Yes. But also on top of that, not just for the kids but others, uh, the way Gabe, um, you know, uh, explained what you all were going to do and explained the different parts and pieces. And when you hear this, this is what's happening here. And when you hear that, that is what's happening at this point in time. It was wonderful. Oh, I'm so I mean, it really was wonderful. And he, of course, is just a generous soul as well in terms of <clears throat> what he brought that, that evening and what, and what the musicians brought. And all of your staff, everybody, what they brought that night. I was even there when they were breaking down. Oh, yeah. They were having a blast. <laughs> That's right. Well, They're happy. We're very proud to have this collaboration right. with St. Vincent de Paul. But, you know, it's, it's just, amazing. Just, well, we, we look forward to April. We look forward to April 12th. And and I and, and again, I think your generosity of spirit is just is so beautiful. And I know that a lot of people that know you also know that you ride your bike everywhere. I'm going to presume that you didn't ride your bike. To, I did to, not ride my bike that, here. Yeah, yeah, and I I what? would have in the past, but I actually got my driver's license specifically for the state touring that we're doing because there's no way. I would ever make the schedule work. I mean, it, we, sometimes we're, 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 I think we were in Corbin one night, Frankfurt the next night, Paducah the night after that, and Bowling Green. Now we're in Danville, and then we go to Fort Knox. I mean, that, that you're not, you can't bike those places. It would take me weeks and weeks and weeks to do it. So I had to get my driver's license. I finally did, and uh, now I'm a driver just like anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love, you know, you know, when when we have time sometime in the in the future, I would love to talk about the different parts of Kentucky that you went. I mean, you could probably write a book about this tour oh, going God, around yeah. to the different parts and the histories of music in the different parts of the state. I'm, I can only imagine is very rich. Oh, it's it's extraordinary. It's it's one of the things that makes Kentucky so fascinating that despite the many challenges we have in this state, the cultural heritage is just overwhelming, and people are so excited to share that, and they're proud of their towns, they're proud of their families, many of which date back to the earliest parts of our state's history. It's just It has been the honor of a lifetime to get to visit all these communities and meet people and hear their stories and uh, and then share music with them and, and see the reactions from people that you can see really value it. Yeah. You know, nobody there takes it for granted. When you go to Appalachia and you bring whole, a whole orchestra into a town like Harlan, nobody takes that for granted. It is so special and beautiful. And uh, we love getting to know the, the, the whole state. And uh, this would never have happened otherwise. Without the, this instigation, I would have never visited these parts of Kentucky. And so already it's just a little symbol of what happens when we, when we find opportunities to unify. Yeah. 
That's, 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 that's We've got to do it here, too, in Louisville. I mean, yeah, it's that, that Louisville is a microcosm of that same issue. Well, there's so much need. And, and for 37 years, I've worked in a whole different I, – I, I'm not steeped in housing. I was in public accounting as, as a <clears throat> consultant and, and auditor and those kinds of things. And, and I have to say that it, it, if not for the opportunity to be at St. Vincent de Paul – I really wouldn't have had the opportunity to see a side of Louisville where there's so much need, but also so much hope. And and so again, when when we have you know music with without borders come to St. Vincent de Paul, it's so it's it's so important uh, to us and, and to the community. So please keep doing it. And, oh, we will. and we'd love to keep. Right now, I'm just saying it. I don't know if it's possible in the future, but we'd love to keep hosting you. All. Oh, that's the plan. We love being there, and it is very very special to see. So many different audiences converge on your campus. Right. To, you know, obviously the, the the neighborhood is very vibrant, but you also have your residents that that we would not normally be playing for that population. That's and right. to see them interacting with the people that are driving in from who knows where, just to see an orchestra show mixed with the people that have walked in from the neighborhood and, and knowing that that interaction is taking place because music is what literally brought them together. That's the high point of our of our goals. And, and it's because of your generosity in hosting us that that's all happening. Yeah. So we look forward to April 12th. I can't wait. I can't wait. And, and so I have to say, and I have to bring this up, the Grammy Award. Oh yeah, I saw you. I saw your speech. Yeah. You look great, walking up there and, oh, yeah. and, and, and all that. And and so you know, so just for uh, the purposes of our our, our listeners, uh, Teddy uh, took home a, a, a Grammy Award, first Grammy Award, but best classical instrumental solo for an orchestra's performance in the American Project with world uh, renowned pianist Yu Zhao Wang. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was that moment like <laughs> going up there on stage pretty accepting surreal. that award? It was pretty surreal. It was very, very weird. Um, I mean, I really was not expecting to win for one. Uh, but when I heard our name announced, I thought, oh, my God, this is this is really happening. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, you can't put too much stock in awards and accolades or anything like that. And, and we always have a saying that you can't read your own reviews because you got to believe the good with the bad. But... But still, that's a kind of achievement for our city to have our orchestra win a Grammy on behalf of Louisville and Kentucky to have our our orchestra get on the biggest stage, the most important award ceremony in music is is a moment to celebrate. We have to celebrate that. And okay. and it's been so nice to see how proud people are of that. I mean, not 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 just on my behalf, but on their behalf. Like the random people in the community seem so excited. It's a little like if a you know the football team wins the Super Bowl. Yeah, you're happy for the team, but people are just happy for the city. They're happy yeah, for themselves. Right. And it, it's been really nice to see that because I feel like as a community, we need those moments when we celebrate ourselves and we feel proud and excited about our town. And, and a lot of times when we hear a lot of negative news that's consistent, uh, that starts to become a bit demoralizing and, and tiring to hear. And so this was a moment, I think, for, for everybody that heard it, even if they don't even go to the orchestra, to feel excited about the city. And, and we're just so honored that we could bring the, the Grammy to Louisville. Well, congratulations. On Thank that. you. It's just really phenomenal. I was so proud to see you up on that stage and representing all of us so well. And, well, thank you. And, I, you know, you talk about Super Bowls. You were just in Buffalo. We haven't won a Super Bowl yet, but oh, the I Philharmonic's know. great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, people really know their football there. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Teddy, thank you so much for your time, for your generosity. Uh, again, the Music Without Borders means so much to us, and the partnership means so much to us, and uh, we, we couldn't be happier and uh, yeah, like I said before, you're a blessing to our community. Keep doing what you're doing. And if there's anything we could do to help you, please let us know. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the yeah. podcast today. We can't wait for the upcoming Music Without Borders. Do you have any sense of, I mean, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I, April 12th, uh, oh, yeah. they're different. Every, they're, they're, program's, every different. program's different. Every yeah. different. Oh, this is going to be a really good one. It's going to feature our rap school, which are these young rappers that we, we teach to, to rap with the orchestra. Uh, and they've been writing all kinds of original raps that they're going to present. So this this is going to be really oh, this cool. Is be, this is a good one. This is really special. Yeah, that's going to be a good yeah, one. Yeah, we're going to have to make sure that we really get the word out on this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you.